As we already know that 19th century India was ridden with a lot of castes and a lot of social hierarchies that were maintained in the society. Now these castes and the societal um, norms came um, you know, to clash with one another because the ideas of the society that were prevalent at that point of time was such that there was a distinction between the lower and the upper classes. Now we already know the fact that the Indian society was divided into four, um, you know, caste of Varna basis, which was first was the Brahmanas, then comes the Kshatriyas, then the Vaishyas and the Sudras. Now, these, uh, you know, people did not live in harmony and there came up across certain evil social practices that started to be observed and that grew at one point of time in 19th century India. So in this animation, we can see the four castes that were there in India and we realized that, you know, these three castes always oppose the existence of the Shudras, which it called the lower caste, right? So you can see how they were afraid of even, you know, uh, of the shadow of the Shudras and the Shudras were supposed to live outside of the other four castes where they lived. In fact, when a Shudra would come, they would close all the door and the Shudra would have to ring a bell to make sure that people know that they were here and they would close all their windows and doors so that, you know, a blunder would not happen uh, in coming face to face with the Shudras. Now, this was also the point of time when certain rituals and evil practices as we were discussing were also very prevalent. Now, it is not unknown that these evil practices or ideas like these shackled the Indian society, shackled the mentality of the people. And not just the factor of untouchability or caste distinction. As you can see uh, on your screen, things like female infanticide, dowry, sati, as well as child marriage were also prevalent in the 19th century India, where, uh, you know, on the other hand, female infanticide had become the order of the day, right? Girl child was killed and it was also that dowry was extracted to the maximum from the brides. Now, we also are standing at a point of time when child marriage was very, very prevalent. What was child marriage? Child marriage was basically when a girl of eight years, of less than eight years of age, was married off to a man of 55 years or more than that. So you can understand that little girls were being married to uh, old men. Right. Now, what would happen when this man who is of 55 of 60 years, when that man dies? So that is when Sati was performed. What was Sati? The Sati was that this child or the bride of the man would be, you know, sent to the funeral pyre with him. So it was that the bride was burnt alive when the man passed away. So we can understand the horrendous practices that went on in 19th century India and these practices you know, made the societal situation so corrupt and bound these people to the shackles of evil mentalities. As people started to gain education, we see certain people, you know, gaining importance at one point of time. And these are the people who come to the forefront to break the situation that existed in 19th century India. So we see that few educated Indians understood the seriousness of the situation, the seriousness of the problems at that point of time and dedicated their lives in an attempt to change it, right? We see people like Swami the Vivekanand, Jyoti Rao, Phule, Ram Mohan Roy and Dayanand Saraswati and also many other reformers who come forward at this point of time and they try to reform the structure of the, uh, you know, Indian society in 19th century India. 
one of the most famous and leading faces of this particular reform movement was Ram Mohan Roy. Now, Raja Ram Mohan Roy was born in an orthodox Brahmin family in 1772. Though he was born in an orthodox family and a Brahmin family in particular, he, you know, should have been attached to the orthodox practices. But it happened so that Ramohan Roy was introduced to Western education and the exposure to Western education made him realize the flaws in the Indian society. Now, when he came face to face with these flaws, he came to the forefront to change the existing situation. The title of Raja to Ram Mohan Roy was given by the then Mughal Emperor Akbar II, who wanted um, Raja Ram Mohan Roy to go to the English government, to the British government, and convince them to come up with certain welfare activities and welfare um, laws for the Indian people. So, this is an image from the Bengali film showing. Raja Ram Mohan showing Raja Ram Mohan Roy being given the title of Raja by Akbar II. Now, Ram Mohan Roy and his ideas were, of course, very staunch because he believed that all these, you know, religious observations were useless religious practices right and Ram Mohan Roy also believed in monotheism so be, he believed in the theory of one god and did not believe in idol worship so he said no to idol worship and to meaningless rituals Raja Ram Mohan Roy went ahead with his rational and religious ideas when he established the Atmiya Sabha in 1870. So basically he wanted to establish uh, an organization that would give place to open-minded ideas rather than you know the orthodox practices that was followed in the name of religion. So Raja Ram Mohan Roy also translated Sanskrit Vedas and Upanishads into Bengali, right? And this became his, you know, fundamental work that Raja Ram Mohan Roy did. But you might have a question as to why translate Sanskrit Vedas and Upanishads. Now, if you remember, uh, you know, when we were studying Christianity as well, that Christianity, uh, that during the rise of Christianity, Bible was also translated into common people's language so that they could read about religion, they could understand what was wrong and what was right. So that exactly was done by Raja Ram Mohan Roy here when he translated the Sanskrit Vedas and Upanishads in Bengali because these Vedas and Upanishads primarily were not meant for common people to be read and it could only be interpreted by the Brahmins. Now that gave Brahmins a lot of power in their hands that they could misuse and they did misuse at that point of time. So what Ram Mohan Roy did was he gave power to the people to read and understand what exactly the Vedas and the Upanishads were talking about Hinduism particularly. So we see that in 1828, Raja Ram Mohan Roy went ahead with much more organizational activities and he established the Brahmo Sabha which later came to be known as the Brahmo Samaj. And the idea of the Brahmo Sabha and the Brahmo Samaj was to bring forward Western education, to curb the social evils, as well as an overall upliftment of the society. So we see that Brahmo Samaj or Brahmo Sabha later also um, you know, ardently practiced and promoted the idea of monotheism or belief in one God. So, in this particular picture, this, these are all the people of Brahmo Samaj. And in the last line, so in this particular line, we see the original members of the Atmiya Sabha. So, basically, Atmiya Sabha gave way to the Brahmo Samaj and then Brahmo Sabha gave way to Brahmo Samaj. Now, 
at that point of time when uh, you know we are talking about 19th century india hinduism was also very corrupt as a religion right now hinduism could not eliminate the evils that was in the society and the religion per se also was becoming very corrupt so uh, brahmohan roy came face to face with the social evils at that point of time when polygamy child marriage and uh, you know caste discrimination female infanticide was very prevalent as we were discussing now this was also the point of time when rights or civil rights or property rights weren't given to women so women did not per se have too many rights now we think we imagine that the present times are so tough for women but imagine about 200 years ago what could be the situation that women were in it was dire when women were in the shackles of these evil practices that were being practiced continuously without any protection given to the girl child or to the woman now raja ramohan roy and the biggest um, sort of input that brahmo sabha particularly gave in changing the situation at that point of time was their win against the practice of sati so this was the point of time when brahmo sabha was you know ardently propagating the fact that sati should not be um, you know observed as a ritual and this was also supported by the british when william benting issued the anti sati act or he made sati illegal in 18 29 which became a victory for brahmo sabha as well as the ideas of raja ram mohan roy now raja ram mohan roy also uh, you know saw that there was no amount of appropriate education that was being given to the youth um, also uh, you know women were not receiving education so at this point of time the society had also started to become very backward because they were stuck with the traditional modes of teaching traditional ideas of teaching so what ram mohan roy did is he collaborated with alexander duff who was a scottish missionary and david hare who was a scottish scholar to come together and promote western education now you might already remember that raja ram mohan roy was also influenced by western education which shaped his ideas so we can understand that why exactly he was trying to promote that change in the society so at this point of time then we see that there are not only changes in religious terms but also in societal terms as well so raja ram mohan roy with alexander duff and david hare established the hindu college which is now known as presidency university and the hindu college was established in 1817 not only that ram mohan roy also established a college called scottish church which was established in 1830 and this focused on the coed education right now this became the first institution to promote coed studies and this also became the institution that promoted western education and you know brought the education system out of the traditional orthodox methodologies it was not only through schools or colleges that ram mohan roy was trying to change the educational aspect of the society now ram mohan roy established a newspaper called samvad kaumudi which was fo focused on you know make people understand the concepts of freedom of press that was to be spread among masses by raja ram mohan roy and this was established by journals like samvad comedy and also several other journals that were established at that point of time now here we can see 
an Indian nationalist newspaper during the British times. And this is talking about uh, Indian nationalism and the changing face of it. So you can understand how uh, you know press became very crucial to let people know about the advancements that are happening in the society at that point of time. Raja Ramohan Roy passed away in Bristol in 1833 when he visited England. But Raja Ramohan Roy left back a big legacy behind him, a legacy that was to be carried forward by the reformers who came after him. This is a statue in Bristol that is located in England of Raja Ramohan Roy. Raja Ramohan Roy passed away in which year and where? Was it in 1831 India, 1723 USA, 1832 Calcutta or 1833 Bristol? The answer is in 1833 in Bristol. Now have you ever considered the fact that was it only always men who received education or did women also receive education in the same way that men did? That is correct. It was not always the same case as we see right now the situations that we live in. right? Because women at one point of time were thought only to be in the households and they were not allowed to move out of the household and neither were they allowed to gain education. Now this picture was changed by Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar. Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar was originally born as Ishwar Chandra Bondopadhyay and he brought the change in the structure in the way women's education was perceived and Essentially, his reforms were towards women and their betterment and upliftment. Ishwarchandra Vidyasagar was a very intelligent boy from a very young age. And he belonged from a very poor family who at that point of time could not even afford the gas lanterns that were available. So it is known and it is said in a form of a story that Ishwarchandra could only study under a lamp, a street lamp as you can see in the story. So he wanted to receive education and he loved to study so much that he would go to any extent to finish his education. In fact, fables have it that once when Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar was traveling with his father to Calcutta only by walking because at that point of time that was the only mode of transport, he saw milestones which had you know numbers written on it. So Ishwar Chandra was taught by his father the numbers through the milestones. That was the first time Ishwar Chandra learned about the numbers and this way he carried on with his education. So here we can see the picture where, where Ishwar Chandra is with his father on the journey and he is learning these numbers. Now Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar very soon completed his education and became a renowned Sanskrit scholar and soon he was given the duty to head the Sanskrit college. Now as soon as Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar got the hold of the Sanskrit college, he became the head of the Sanskrit college, he opened it to all the castes because Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar believed in equality of all castes and he was a staunch reformer who stood against any discrimination on the basis of caste. So we see Ishwar Chandra was appointed the principal of Sanskrit college and this is exactly the place that gave him the name Vidyasagar, the ocean of knowledge because he had gained so much knowledge over the years uh, when he was finishing his education. Thus we see that the title Vidyasagar was given to him in the Sanskrit college years. And he opened the gates of the Sanskrit college to people of all castes. 
Now, Vidya Sagar saw when he came, uh, you know, when he became the principal of Sanskrit College, he noticed the fact that there were very few women who could go out of their houses and gain this education or gain the knowledge in the colleges that were being established. Now, Vidya Sagar wanted to change the structure. So, he collaborated with John Eliot Drinkwater Bethun, who was at that point of time creating new schools for women, right? So he collaborated with Bethun to promote women's education and Bethun school was uh, firstly established after which Bethun College was established. And we know the Bethun College even located in Kolkata today. And this was the first established school in 1849 and then as a college in 1879. But the point was that Vidyasagar, even after uh, you know schools and colleges were being made especially for women, he noted that none of uh, you know the girls were being sent out of their households so it was very few handful of girls who were being introduced to the new forms of education system so what came as a push uh, to the current situation was that kadombini ganguli and chandramukhi basu became the two first graduates in the british india so kadombini ganguli and Chandramukhi Basu became the first graduates in the whole of British India. So this changed the face of education of women. When women started to uh, you know, prosper even in the fields of education, that is when others sort of gained that impetus. They gained that push to move uh, out of their households and get the knowledge that was being imparted in the new schools. Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar not only focused on women's education, but also like Ramohan Roy on the evil practices that were going on in the society. So he wanted to reform those as well. And the biggest input that Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar gave was the Widow Remarriage Act. He was backed by the British and essentially Lord Dalhousie introduced the Widow Remarriage Act in 1856 that legalized widow remarriages in India. Before that, widows were living in dire situations and widows had a very poverty stricken life even if they weren't supposed to. Um, after the death of the husband, it was often considered that the woman is not pious anymore. So we see that Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar's works are centered around women empowerment and women upliftment for the widows and the girl child. So we see that a book that was written by Vidyasagar showing why widows should be given an option to get remarried and why it is not a sin. In fact, for widows at that point of time, living was a sin because she was living even after the death of her husband. So here, Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar wanted to give them a better life, a better um, you know, living standard. And that is why he was promoting the idea of widow remarriage. In this picture, you can see how Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar is organizing a widow remarriage. So a palanquin is being carried, which is a marker of Bengali wedding amidst the outrage of the people. So that is very important to note here that people were not really um, you know, interested in these changes. In fact, there was a lot of outrage coming from the orthodox, from the traditional mindset that why should these changes be, uh, you know, uh, be brought when the Vedas and the Upanishads had this. But that wasn't the case. And therefore, people like Ram Mohan, people like Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar were bringing the change in the society. 
Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar also wrote a Bengali primary book that is used even in schools today in West Bengal, which is called Borno Porichoy. Borno Porichoy was a book that had the basics of grammar in simple constructive sentences and uh, you know, it is one of the fundamental books that is given to a child who is learning Bengali even today. Now, you will be surprised to know that there was somebody who took after the name of Vidya Sagar. So, there was a person who was called the Vidya Sagar of the South. It was Kandukuri Verisalingam. So, Verisalingam basically took to the path shown by Vidya Sagar and he started to work for the empowerment of women. So he was known as the Vidya Sagar of South India and he promoted education for girls as well as widow remarriage. So we see that here Verisalingam set up the home for widowed women. He established the Widow Remarriage Association, which basically became the home to house these widows who were, um, you know, sent out of the society and were kept isolated, in fact, in the society. So he set up homes for widows at Rajamundri and Madras. So his area of work was South India. Thus, we see how exactly these minds who were uh, educated, who were well established, they were taking to the fores and they were coming in the forefront to fight against the social and religious evil practices that, um, you know, shackled the 19th century India. They were not only heroes who were staunch reformers, but also people who shaped the newer India that we live in today. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. Master each topic with our adaptive practice technology. Get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests. Get all your doubts resolved instantly, learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and iPads. So, at Delta Step, learning is not just fun and easy, it is rewarding too. So, register for free now.